Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Happy New Year, everybody. This is the first podcast I'm recording in the new year, although I don't know when you're hearing it. I, I've got several in the queue now, and so I don't know when I'm going to release this. But in any case, the new year started on a depressing note for me. The philosopher Derek Parfit died yesterday. As many of you know, he is someone who I often refer to as a genius. He was just one of the most brilliant people. I never met him, unfortunately, and in the last few months I had been exchanging emails with him, initially trying to get him on the podcast, and when that failed, trying to get him to do a, a written Q&A for me on my blog, which he agreed to do, but had many irons in the fire and many complications in his life, including health ones. And at a certain point, I decided to no longer remind him that he had agreed to do this. And now I'm left with the strange feeling of having tried to claim some of the great man's time when he was quickly running out of it. So in any case, read his books, in particular, the book upon which he made his name, Reasons and Persons. Just an astonishing, luminous, and deeply strange work. If any work of philosophy seems like it could have been written by a Martian, and a very wise one at that, it's that book. That's all I'm thinking about at the moment. Surely I have something else to announce, but it can wait until the next podcast. Today I am speaking with Lawrence Wright. Lawrence is a journalist, and an author, and a screenwriter, and a playwright. He is very well known as a staff writer for The New Yorker magazine. And he has written many works of nonfiction, a book called Remembering Satan, The Looming Tower, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize, Going Clear, the revelatory work about Scientology that was made into a documentary, 13 Days in September. And his most recent book is The Terror Years, which is a, a compilation of all his writing on Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State that he did for The New Yorker. So needless to say, our, our interests on a variety of topics here overlap. I've never met Lawrence. I've, I've never gotten a chance to speak with him before. So it was great to have an excuse to do it. That's one of the amazing things about having this podcast as a forum. I can send someone I admire an email. I ask them if they want to have a conversation. Sometimes they do, and you get to hear it. So without further ado, I introduce you to the great Lawrence Wright. I have Lawrence Wright on the line. Lawrence, thanks for coming on the podcast. Good to talk to you, Sam. So I will have introduced you before we got on here, but tell people how you describe yourself. Do you think of yourself as a journalist first, or are you an author more generally? How do you, how do you think of yourself? I guess I think of myself as a writer. I, I write, um, in addition to journalism, I, I write plays and movies, and uh, I've written a novel. Uh, so I, I like uh, experimenting with different forms. Yeah, well, that's actually one of the things I most admire about what you're doing. I mean, I'm a huge fan of your work, but the quality of the work aside, I love the way you use so many different platforms to communicate your ideas. It often starts with a New Yorker article, but your, your articles often become books, and some of these books become documentaries, and one became a stage play and then became a documentary, and so it's, it's, it's very creative, and you're like the king of media at this point. It's really it's very <laughs> cool to see. I, 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 thanks for that, but it, mainly I think uh, there's a, the hardest thing as a writer is finding the ideas that you want to write about. And uh, there's such a paucity of ideas that you want to devote your life to. And uh, so when I hit on something um, that I'm really intrigued by, then I sometimes try to work it into different forms. Well, is there a, a primary concern or, or set of ideas that unifies all of your work? I mean, how, how do you decide what sorts of topics to, to address? You know, it's very intuitive, but now that I'm older, I look back and I see that uh, I've had a lifelong interest in religion and why people believe one thing rather than another. Uh, it seems to be a thread that goes through much of my work. I was th thinking along those lines myself. 
it seems to me that that you and I share a common interest in the power of belief, and in particular, the power of bad beliefs, you know, bad ideas that that become ascendant in some context or another. And we'll get into specifically these different topics, but you spent a lot of time thinking about Islamic extremism and Scientology and other cult-like phenomenon like Jonestown. And what's interesting to me, I and mean, this has it's been a point of frustration, but it's something I really admire about how you've treated these topics, is that many people actually doubt whether or not ideas matter very much. And it's very common to meet people who think that that good people will do good things and bad people will do bad things, and that ideology is more or less always just a pretext for good and bad people to do whatever they were going to do anyway. But one of the most refreshing things about your discussion of these aberrant belief systems is that you make it clear how much beliefs matter and that that bad beliefs can get even very good people to do terrible things. I, I would limit that mainly to, uh, at least in our era, to religious beliefs. Uh, I think the the notion that beliefs are uh, discountable uh, mainly comes from observing the uh, hypocrisy of political figures and and people who hold strong political views but then act completely differently uh, in their own behavior. Whereas what intrigued me as a journalist, uh, you know, religion has very little status in the world of journalism. It's uh, mm. seen as like uh, covering cooking or something like that in your <laughs> daily newspaper. You know, the religion beat would be uh, off the in the back section. But uh, I observe somewhere along the line that people can have very strong political views without it changing their lives at all. But people who have strong religious views. Uh, that tends to determine their behavior in a very powerful way, for good or ill. Yeah. Well, so let's get into, first I'll name the books. There's really three books I want to focus on here. The Looming Tower, which is your amazing book about Al-Qaeda. And we could also throw in here the the stage play and documentary, My Trip to Al-Qaeda, which is also fascinating and, and connected to that book. And then you have your, your most recent book, the, the Terror Years, which, again, is also on the same topic. And then there's Going Clear, which is your book and, and the subsequent documentary on Scientology. And if we have time, I'd like to touch on your book, Remembering Satan, because that is just one of the strangest stories ever told. We'll see if we get there. Let's start with jihadism and Islamism. Now, you were on this topic, at least to some degree, before most people were aware of these issues, because you wrote this film, The Siege, which came out in 1998, which depicts jihadist terrorism in New York, and then kind of the the attendant infringements of civil liberties that came in response. Mm -hmm. Do you remember at what point you were aware of jihadism as a global issue and not just a, a local problem with that was narrowly focused on Israel? Well, you know, I had lived in Egypt as a young man, and um, I was I was there when Nasser died in 1970, and one of Sadat, who succeeded him, one of his first actions was to let the Muslim brothers out of prison. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of our professors had a brother who got out, and I was aware, you know, this stirring inside Islam, I suppose, before a lot of other Western people were. Uh, and then I, when I was working on the siege, um, this is in the middle 90s, and, uh, you know, Egypt was in tumult at the time. But uh, my producer had asked me to write a movie about a woman in the CIA. And that was <laughs> that was the whole idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't really, it was just a notion, really. And I was trying to think about, well, this Cold War is over. Who is the enemy? And it wasn't obvious uh, at the time. And finally, I realized that the CIA did have a real life antagonist, and it was the FBI. And what they mm -hmm. were struggling over was who was going to control terrorism in the United States. And that became the axis for the siege. And Denzel Washington played the FBI chief, and uh, and Annette Bening was a CIA woman that had you know the idea had spawned been spawned from. And as I began researching that, um, I, I turned up uh, the information about uh, bin Laden 
and about, uh, you know, of course, there was Omar Abdel Rahman, who was known as the blind sheikh, mm -hmm. who had a plan afoot uh, to blow up the Lincoln Tunnel and the Statue of Liberty. And, you know, there were a lot of terrorist plots that were going around at the time. And um, then the movie, uh, the trailers in the movie um, appeared in August of 98. And that, of course, was the same month that the American embassies in East Africa were blown up by Al Qaeda. It was their opening blow. Mm. There was another bombing that same month uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, that people don't really know very much about. It was at a planet Hollywood. Right, right. And uh, it was uh, a, an Islamist, a radical Islamist group claim credit for blaming the trailers that were uh, for the movie The Siege mm. uh, as, the, as their provocation. And the reason they struck Planet Hollywood is that Bruce Willis, one of the co-stars of the movie, was a partial owner of that chain. So, uh, you know, it was a, a real shock to me because two people were killed and a little girl lost her leg. And all of this uh, came about uh, because I had written this movie. So I was affected by terrorism, I guess, earlier than most Americans. Yeah, yeah, I had heard of that story. I think you you talk about that at least in my trip to Al Qaeda. Right. And that's always been why I have resisted offers to translate some of my more hard hitting criticisms of Islam into the relevant languages, because I remember Salman Rushdie's experience of, you know, apart from his experience of of having to go into hiding just his experience of finding out that his translators and foreign publishers had been killed or attacked. And yeah. that had to be rough. Did you feel there would have been very little basis, or, or at least most people wouldn't have formed an expectation that, that anything like that would happen in response to a film like this at that point? Were you just blindsided by it or did you feel? I was totally thunderstruck. You know, it was, it was uh, of course now, you know, at the, at the same time when the movie came out, uh, there, were, there were protests uh, there were uh, Muslims uh, were angry at being depicted as terrorists. They thought that was a stereotype of Hollywood and they were uh, picketing the theaters. It was a big box office failure mm. uh, uh, until 9-11 when it was the most rented movie in America. Right. But uh, it was it was a really uh, it was a scarring experience. And, uh, you know, it, it came out of the blue. Where were you on 9-11 and what were you working on? Well, I, I, at that time, I was uh, having breakfast with a group. I, every Tuesday morning, we'd get together and speak Spanish. So uh, that's where I was. And uh, at the time, I was uh, planning to get out of journalism. I had the idea that I'd become a movie director. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was writing scripts for me to direct. And... Um, uh, and then suddenly 9-11 happened and, you know, I realized I was going to get back on the fire truck. And in all the work you have done since on jihadism, what would you say you've learned about it? Well, I've, I've learned, for one thing, that belief is very powerful in affecting uh, even violent behavior. But one of the things that intrigued me about um, uh, the origins of this movement especially in Egypt, is that a lot of the people who went into uh, al-Jihad, which was the Egyptian organization, and then later al-Qaeda, weren't really very religious. Uh, they were drawn, they, in some ways, they were drawn into protest. Uh, you'd have to understand that living in uh, Arab countries, most Arab countries at the time, uh, was a very stifling experience. Uh, their tyrannies and the opportunities for uh, expression are very few. And there's not very much alternative to uh, either being uh, a member of the government, a bureaucrat, you know, or a member of the army. Uh, and then there's a very diminished private sector. And then if you want to have any kind of alternative expression, you go to the mosque. And that's where the Muslim brothers arose. So there were people that I think were drawn into this movement, and some of them were, you know, idealists, the kind of people that you, you could build a country on 
in other respects, but they were, you know, they were their dreams had been kind of perverted and drawn into these radical expressions of Islam. One of the problems in the Arab world is there's so few uh, spiritual choices. Uh, you know, you can only believe one thing. Your your choice is to believe it more or less. And so the what happened in in uh, in Egypt was that young men who were not originally very pious uh, would be drawn into uh, these kind of radical groups. They were wanting to affect some kind of change in their country, but in the same time, they underwent changes themselves. And they became radicalized by the more strenuous views of Islam. Mm-hmm. And they began, they began to use those views to justify the actions that they were taking. Yeah, I, w- I want to drill down a little bit on what you just said there, that they were not very religious, because I think people can misunderstand what you're saying, or perhaps you and I disagree about the implications of what you're saying. Because it's true that, that many people don't come from madrasas, many people don't show any signs of of religiosity, much less extreme religiosity, in their earlier life. But the people who become suicide bombers, at the point they become committed, really do believe what they say they believe. I mean, it's, it, the beliefs are, are are operative at that point, and and the history of how they got to that point mm-hmm. is an interesting one. And I mean, you can have you know kids in in Orange County becoming radicalized, but once they are actually radicalized they do share this belief system. And so it's a lot of people take, I think, a false comfort in looking at the biographies of some of these people and they say, well, this, this, is, this person didn't come out of a madrasa. This person went to the London School of Economics. So clearly this isn't about religion. There's something else going on here. But for the person who has an awakening experience of some kind, that gets channeled into Salafi-style Islam, and they take it all the way into the end zone of wanting to get into paradise, you know, right now. Mm-hmm. However secular they had seemed up until a year ago or 15 minutes ago, at a certain point, what, what gets them to actually act is this worldview that has gotten communicated to them somehow. Do, do you disagree with that? Do you, do you think there's a secular route to, to martyrdom that is equally well subscribed in, in this world? Well, if you look at you know the world that we're talking about now, the radical Islam, there are Islamists who become radicalized, uh, mm-hmm. and there are radical uh, radicals who become Islamized. You know, they they you know you can come from both of those directions and and arrive at the same point. And then you have people like Ramzi Yusuf who bombed the World Trade Center in 1993, not at all religious. Uh, he was just using, uh, you know, the religious ideas. He, he didn't really express them himself, but he used religious uh, compatriots. And, and uh, you know, he, he worked with Omar Abdul Rahman, the blind sheikh, mm. uh, but he was not at all religious himself. And there are people like that. Although he wasn't a suicide bomber. No, uh, but, you know, the, the world of suicide bombers inside, the, you know, is, is a fairly small one. The world of radical Islam is quite large. Yeah, I would agree. I guess, I, guess, I mean, my issue is, I mean, I, I certainly don't doubt that there are some people who wage war against the West, in some sense, under the banner of Islam without sincerely believing all of its precepts. But and then there are gradations of this. I, I saw that you had interviewed my, my friend and, and collaborator, Majid Nawaz, which I, I, yeah. I had forgotten. I had seen my trip to Al-Qaeda some years ago when it, I think, first came out, and then watched it again in, in anticipation of this conversation, and then was surprised. I, I didn't know Majid when I had first seen it, obviously, because I, I had no recollection he was in there. So Majid is, when he was an Islamist, was not not a a budding suicide bomber. I mean, so there there are different points of commitment on that spectrum of of being organized under this banner. But for me, the 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 most toxic part of the center of the bullseye here for the the role of belief is in particular this sincere belief in martyrdom, because it, it seems to me this has two consequences. It, it allows people to actually love death more than we love life. That becomes a sincere statement of just psychological fact. And therefore, to seek death, in this they become really undeterrable. And you describe people like this in in the Looming Tower, and particularly the early Al-Qaeda 
members who were fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan mm -hmm. who were taking absolutely no steps to protect their own lives. And when queried about this, they said, yeah, we, we, the whole point is to get killed here, right? But the other thing is that this, it allows people, whether they're suicide bombers or not, to kill innocents without any compunction because really by this worldview, nothing can go wrong. The good will go to heaven, the infidels will go to hell where they belong, and you can blow yourself up in a crowd of children and, and you have literally done nothing wrong because there's no conceivable outcome that is a bad outcome, given that God is overseeing all this and everyone gets what they deserve in the end anyway. Yeah, it's, to some extent, I think that we have people that are acting out of beliefs that are uh, giving them a moral cover for actions that um, you know one can't otherwise understand. But they're also psychopaths in this as mm -hmm. well, and you know they're drawn like moss to it. Um, and I think that a lot of the phenomenon of ISIS, you know, is fed by that. Uh, I mean, people are excited by the by the carnage. And um, and they they flock to it. And then on the way, they pick up these beliefs almost like garments. You know, a lot of the people that you see, you know, they they don't have this extremist religious background before they get there. And uh, and I don't know how seriously I'm, I'm, we're talking about. There's not a single unified theory for why all these people arrive at the same place. There are many different paths to it and different personalities that are animated by different philosophies and, and longings and, 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 and dysfunctions. And, uh, and so they, they can come in many different routes. You know, there's an interesting theory about um, uh, uh, Stefan Hertog wrote a, a, a book uh, called Engineers of Jihad. Mm -hmm. uh, and he talked about uh, the uh, the number of people who come into uh, jihad from a technical, uh, especially engineering background, and even speculates that some of them are are on the autism spectrum. Uh, and I I think you know you can look at you know this if you have the whole universe of people who are dedicating their lives to jih Islamic jihad, uh, you're going to find. Uh, that a lot of the leaders are going to be those kinds of engineering people who can use, well, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is a perfect example, not a religious man himself, really. Uh, and he's Ramza Yusuf's uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but he was able to, to use people who had these beliefs to force, you know, to like, uh, like the hijackers of 9-11 and, uh, and, and persuade them to give up their lives to enact the vision that he's created. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I was struck in watching my trip to Al-Qaeda again because I had first seen it before anyone had even heard of ISIS, I believe. I was struck at one point you, you were reading from some of the, the stated goals of Al-Qaeda at that point, and it was interesting to see how much ISIS had, had achieved those goals. Mm -hmm. they, they, they seemed to be in the process of, of losing those gains, but I had forgotten how explicit al-Qaeda's goal was to form a caliphate in Iraq and to use it as a basis by which to ultimately create a global one and to draw us into further into a quagmire there. It just seemed like ISIS was the culmination not merely of al-Qaeda in Iraq and the crazy sectarian sadism that, that got expressed there, but the original vision of al-Qaeda. How do you view ISIS as being the same or different from, from Al-Qaeda at this point? Well, there are stylistic differences and, you know, their, their goals are the same. You know, they, they want to Islamize the world. They want Islam to be the only superpower in the world. And uh, they feel resentful that, uh, that it has been you know, put on the back shelf in the way. Uh, there, for, to some extent, the idea of the caliphate was something that bin Laden had in mind as, as a distant goal, because first of all, you would have to persuade Muslims that uh, this is something they were going to have to uh, impl implement eventually. And, uh, but Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was the founder of uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq, which became the, the precursor to ISIS, uh, he was in a, a hurry, and he was not patient. 
as as Bin Laden was, and also he had a, uh, a dis- he had a yen to create a civil war inside Islam, which he succeeded in doing uh, by waging war on the Shiites. You know, Bin Laden wanted to to fight the West. He wanted to drive the West out of Arab and Muslim lands, and uh, so that it could be thoroughly Islamized according to the sort of his Salafi philosophy. Hmm. But uh, and then eventually, you know, you would create a caliphate. And Zarqawi had a, you know, a, just a different battle plan. And uh, so he became uh, he became very prominent when we had Al Qaeda under such pressure that bin Laden and Zawahiri and the other leaders of Al Qaeda couldn't keep their heads above the ground. W- meanwhile, Zarqawi's out, you know, creating total mayhem on the ground in Iraq. And uh, this was exciting to a lot of young Muslims who wanted to get in on the action and believed in the goals that Zarqawi was espousing. He seemed to be a proper psychopath. Would you draw a line between someone like him and bin Laden, just psychologically there? There are fascinating differences. You know, I when I was working on the Looming Tower, I, I was puzzled uh, because Al-Qaeda was essentially an Egyptian organization with a Saudi head on it. And there were, you know, member there were uh, a couple of Jordanians in it. Uh, there, there, but essentially, you know, they were Persian Gulf Arabs and Egyptians. And I, I w- looked around and I wondered, where are the Palestinians? Where are the Lebanese? Where are the Jordanians and the Syrians? The region that we call the Levant. Where are they in Al-Qaeda? And I realized that uh, there was actually another training camp in Afghanistan at the same time bin Laden was running his. And uh, it was run by uh, Zarqawi. And he actually got money support from bin Laden, although he was not formally a member of Al Qaeda at the time. But that was the group that went into Iraq after we invaded and uh, and began to prosper there. And so you look at bin Laden, he was an international businessman, uh, you know, college educated, wealthy, uh, extremely wealthy at one point. Um, and, uh, you know, s- sort of the I, I compared him, I, I, I described him as Saudi Arabia's first celebrity. Mm. And, uh, you know, he had a lot of uh, not charisma, but more of a mystique about him. And uh, and he was in in some ways kind of delicate in his mannerisms and so on. Uh, Whereas Zarqawi was a criminal. He was a street thug and sex criminal. And uh, he was in prison. um, And it was in prison that uh, he became close to uh, the Sheikh Makdizi, who was a very influential jihadist uh, philosopher. And I think, you know, he was already radical, psychopathic, and then uh, in some ways emboldened by this Islamist philosophy that gave him a warrant to act out uh, the way that I think that he normally wanted to anyway. So, you know, his, his kind of madness, the, the way that he rampaged mm. uh, across Iraq, uh, killing anyone in his path. Suddenly, he had absolute per- divine permission to do so. And there was something awe-inspiring about uh, the way that he uh, waged this uh, unlimited war against the Shiites. And for people that are, uh, you know, drawn to conflict, uh, he, he caught a lot of attention. I, you know, I... I, I imagine you're familiar with the Freud's uh, term, the narcissism of minor differences. Yeah, I, I think that that's really fascinating where religion is concerned, because, uh, you know, Freud talks about how uh, people that are very, very similar in most respects can be the biggest enemies because of very small differences between the two of them. And the Sunnis and the Shiites are a perfect example of that. You know, for, uh, for outsiders, they're just Muslims. Mm-hmm. But uh, for Zarqawi and, and many people who followed him, the 
small historical differences and the stylistic differences in the way they prayed, for instance, were incredibly inflammatory. And, you know, it's, it has created absolute chaos inside the Islamic universe. That gives me an opportunity to point out something that I, I often point out when I'm talking about Islam and Islamism and jihadism and where everything I say is more or less implicitly or explicitly in criticism of the, the doctrine here and the consequences of these ideas and linking, it, linking this doctrine to, to violence. The thing to point out is that the most common victim of this violence is another Muslim. Yeah. By a thousandfold. Yes, yeah. I mean, this is not merely the, the effete concern of a pampered Westerner who doesn't want terrorism in his movie theaters. The reality is the world is on fire with this particular form of sectarian conflict. And, you know, now we're witnessing very likely Europe break apart in part as a result of this conflict in, in Syria and Iraq and the, the attendant migrant crisis, something I might raise with you in a minute. But Tell me about uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri in this context. I mean, so how do you view him as a personality compared to Zarqawi and, and bin Laden? Well, he was a man of science, which is interesting. Mm. Uh, you know, he was a medical doctor, uh, a surgeon. Uh, his father was a professor at, uh, of, of pharmacology at, at, at Cairo University. So he, and he came from a science background, but he, he was also very religious as a young man. And as was bin Laden, um, there was not yeah. not a conversion experience for either man. They just became more deeply implicated in their religion. And uh, it was, uh, you know, I think the experience of, of when Zawahri went off with uh, Muslim brother doctors to Afghanistan during the Mujahideen war against the Soviets, I think that that was a turning point for him. And um, he had already, at the age of 15, you know, had created a cell to overthrow the Egyptian government. Right. Uh, just think about His uh, the audacity of, of this young man. Uh, I, partly, I think he was very influenced by uh, his uncle, uh, who uh, was uh, Said Qutb's lawyer. And Said Qutb is in some ways the, I, I, I guess the you could say, yeah, I mean, it's always intriguing to me, Sam, how movements uh, and belief systems always go back to a book. And, you know, you can trace it in, you know, the the Bible or the Quran or, or uh, you know, Das Kapital or, you know, my, or Hitler's uh, uh, Mein Kampf, Kampf or, you know, the, or even animal rights as animal liberation. I mean, there's always at the bottom of it a book uh, that is so influential. And the book that really gave rise to the Islamist movement was a book that Qutb wrote called Ma'alam Fil Tariq, which means signposts along the road or milestones. Mm -hmm. And he had, uh, in the late 40s, he had kind of fled Egypt because uh, King was mad at him and uh, came to America where he was... Uh, alarmed and disgusted by the American habits, especially our sexual mores. And, and uh, he spent time in this little town called Greeley, Colorado, which in some respects would be a total advertisement for uh, the American dream. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, just, it's a darling little town and had a lot of churches and so on. But no, and there was nothing that anybody could do that pleased him. Even his barber didn't do his hair right. And but he saw some things about America that I, I think Americans weren't willing to look at. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, Said Qutb was a very dark Egyptian and he under, he experienced the racism that was common at the time. Um, he he had crazy notions about uh, a lot of things about America, but uh, he went back to Egypt and wrote some very influential articles and then uh, became the head of the sort of underground wing of the Muslim Brothers, uh, the, the more violent wing. And um, when Gamal Abdel Nasser and the colonels in the Egyptian army staged their coup in 1952, 
Nasser offered Qutb an influential post in the new government, but it wasn't influ influential enough. And Qutb fought against uh, Nasser and the regime, and eventually Nasser had him hanged. Mm. And uh, and that, you know, he became this martyr. But this this uh, book that he wrote on scrap paper that he smuggled out of the prison became the document that uh, that aroused the he, and he called for a vanguard of young men who would make this vision real. And and Zawahiri was certainly one of those people. One thing that's rarely remarked on, but you do it in places, is that the men in Muslim majority countries grow up largely outside the company of women. And I mean, for instance, like you, you just the story you told about Qutb, as I recall, the crisis point for him in his sojourn in Greeley was he he went to a dance where he saw mm -hmm. the you know the young must have been teenagers young men and women dancing in, I think, in the basement of a church. So the fact right. that they had used their church for the, this desecration, and he saw, you know, these young men and women kind of pawing at each other. And, and he, he, there's a passage in somewhere where he talks about just the utter shamelessness of right. the batting eyes of the women and the, the yeah. skin exposed. And what comes through the more than anything was, else. The baby is cold outside. Right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, th there is such obvious frustrated lust here, and mm -hmm. the role played by sexual taboos and the disempowerment of being on the outside of any sphere in which you could plausibly gratify your desires in a way that seemed psychologically and morally healthy to you. Mm -hmm. It's just there's, there's something psychologically so maladaptive about the way sex is viewed in this context. And so I just wanted you to reflect on that. Is there anything we can generalize about the consequences of keeping the, the sexes so radically apart and, and the, the attendant misogyny, I mean, the, the political non-equivalence between men and women in these societies? Well, I've, my experience of it was especially acute in Saudi Arabia. Um, I went there in, uh, I guess it was 2000, I guess 2003 or four, and um, you know the Saudis wouldn't let me in as a journalist, so I I took a job as the mentor to these young journalists in Jeddah, which is Bin Laden's hometown, and um, the men and women really have almost no interaction at all. The you know we think of the for instance the women all dressed up in black and you know sometimes their faces covered as well. But the men are pretty covered up, too. You know, they're in white and the women are in black. It looks like sometimes I feel like it was, I would feel like I was in an opera, you know, with a kind of cappuccino monks or mm -hmm. something like that. going. And uh, one of my reporters, we went to a mall and um, there are some malls where men can't go by themselves if they're not in a family. But this was one mall where we could go in. My reporter was uh, an especially avid uh, Romeo, and uh, he uh, spotted a couple of Saudi women coming down the escalator, and they were totally encased in black. Even their eyes were covered. I mean, sometimes you can't even tell what direction they're facing. And, and he turned to me without a trace of irony. He said, check them out. <laughs> I, there's, there's some power that he must have to see through those garments. It's, it's, I it's clairvoyance. I was, always aware i was totally aware of the, you know this this sense of longing and and of frustration and also i you know a lot of civilization is young men learning how to please girls you cannot get past that and uh and when they're outside of that world uh, and in a world of men almost exclusively then it's a totally unsettled situation where or behaviors are not moderated and in and, and also the, they take out their frustrations in other ways you know what's intriguing about saudi society is that there's a great sense of passivity and i i think you know is born of being demoralized and at the same time you have so many uh, so much of the stream going into radical Islam, into Al Qaeda or other groups, come out of Saudi Arabia, and certainly the ideas, the the propaganda uh, that feeds these religious ideas comes out of Saudi Arabia. 
it's it's not entirely traceable to the gender apartheid, but it is a part of it. Mm. And the absence of civil society, the inability to have to mix uh, freely and talk openly, uh, you know, all of those things create this stifled atmosphere. Yeah, there's also the fact that this is this division between the the, the sexes is part of the, a, a larger honor culture, and then what happens there is you have the women become essentially props in the honor economy of the men. I mean, women become viewed as, especially their, their sexual lives and the, and the prospect that they, there could be some sexual indiscretion, whether it's your wife or your daughter, the fact that that would reflect back on you and your social currency as, as a person of honor, that all seems so dysfunctional and, and such a perfect recipe for unhappiness. And yet it's, it's hard to see how to change it given the status quo. Well, you know, the one thing we should not make the mistake of taking away any sense of agency from these women, the Saudi women. They, they, um, uh, one of my, I had several young Saudi women reporters who I was supposed to mentor. And uh, at first they wouldn't let me see them. They all worked in this little office under the stairwell. And I said, I can't mentor them if I can't see them. So once a week they were allowed to come up in this little black train into the conference room. And uh, I, and one I got to know particularly well, Najwa, um, she was extremely conservative. And, um, you know, she, she wore the abaya, which is the black ve- uh, body veil and the hijab over her head, but she also wore a niqab to cover her face, everything except for the eyes. And she used to cover her eyes as well, but she kept tripping. So she, uh, she, but she would put on gloves. She, she talked about how she tried to become more conservative every year. And, um, it, and I also reflected on the fact that, you know, Saudi women are the mothers of these boys. Yeah. Uh, they have a, a responsibility in, in how they turn out. And, um, uh, I did. I went to Saudi Arabia thinking that women would be a, a, a reservoir of progressive uh, movement of some sort, and I didn't find that. Uh, there were some women who were that way, but in general, I would not say that uh, that Saudi women are a force of liberal ideas. I would be surprised if they were. The beliefs exist on both sides of of this divide, and when I see how. A friend like Ayan Hirsi Ali gets attacked by women who are defending their faith from her criticism, mm-hmm. or you know, Majid Nawaz gets attacked by women as a as a an Uncle Tom. You see what's going on there. Can you say something about the prevalence of conspiracy thinking in the Arab world as you encountered it? Yeah, I I, I was thinking about that uh, as, as I was preparing to talk with you because I, I've find that there's a kind of parallel through mm. the kind of fake news that we're going through now. And um, when, I, um, when I was working in the Arab press and in Saudi Arabia, the uh, one thing I noted is that um, you can have opinions and the newspapers are full of columnists, but what was dangerous were facts. And uh, when I was trying to teach these young reporters how to go out and gather facts. I was actually providing them with skills that they weren't going to be able to use. So the newspapers were vacuous and, um, and, and gossip mongering. And after 9-11, I remember when I was in Egypt and I was talking to a, this Egyptian woman who suggested to me that uh, 9-11 was something that the American government did to itself, uh, which was a very common thing. I ran into it again and again. And uh, I said, this, how can you believe that? I mean, there's no evidence that, um, that the American government had any desire to do that or had any way to participate in it. I mean, I just, it's a totally nonsensical, prejudicial view. What causes you to say that? And she said, well, in Egypt, nobody ever tells us the truth. So we have to determine for ourselves what it might be. And the first question we ask is who benefits? 
uh, and in her view, the beneficiary of 9-11 was the American government because it allowed the U.S. to wage war on the Muslim world. Well, this I can't tell you how common this view is. And, you know, there's absolutely nothing to sustain it. It is just a, a conspiracy theory that has taken root and unfortunately given some uh, support by a, a number of American conspiracists yeah, as have well. Have you gone down that rabbit hole very far, the 9-11 truth phenomenon in, in the West? Oh, yeah. Oh, they used to follow me around in my speeches, and and um, uh, and Alex Jones, uh, it, it, it has, and I've had a conversation before. Uh, he's one of the, the main propagators of, of this kind of nonsense. It, uh, you know, and I've talked to them at length. If If you analyze their view of how 9-11 happened, there's not any doubt that the plane struck the World Trade Center, at least among most of them. Unless you think they were holograms or not actual planes. Yeah, there are there are people that... They had no <laughs> windows, yeah. They go even further, yeah. that it never happened at all. Yeah, it was like the moon landing never happened. But the, the 9-11 truthers normally believe that the planes did strike. But that's not what would happen if a plane right. hit a skyscraper. And uh, of course, this experiment has only happened twice. So, and in both cases, you know, the buildings fell down. But according to the truthers, that's not what would happen. When have you ever seen a building fall into its own footprint, Lawrence? <laughs> yes, right. So, what happened? Well, there must have been explosives planted inside the building to make sure that they fell. And that's where the American government came in because they had to be, you know, stealthily done. Nobody could have observed them. There had to be no evidence for it. And and then in the case of uh, the Pentagon, which didn't fall down, and, you know, uh, the, there are a lot of truthers who say that that was a missile. It wasn't a plane. If that's the case, where are the passengers? You know, where's the plane? What, what about all the people who saw the plane flying low over water? You know, there's, once you start picking apart the things they accept as gospel, there's, there's just nothing but a ludicrous thread of, of conspiracy all knitted together into something that's totally absurd, but which corresponds to their view of the, how the world works. Yeah, and, and crucially, when you follow each one of these anomalies to some alternative conclusion, it's never the same conclusion. There's no unified view of what would explain everything that happened here. There's dozens or hundreds or more different things, all of which are mutually incompatible, but all of which are different from the prevailing story that Al-Qaeda did it. Mm -hmm. But there is no unified view that makes it the perfect work of evil genius to have George Bush sitting, reading My Pet Goat when this thing mm -hmm. goes off, you know, mm -hmm. you know, what evil genius decided that to do it that way. I mean, this larger phenomenon of conspiracy thinking, which, again, now, once you connect it to the, the fake news phenomenon that we're living through now, it becomes hugely consequential. It's, it's like this, I've always thought of conspiracy thinking as a kind of pornography of doubt. There's an itch that people are scratching here. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. People who, for the most part, feel disempowered and imagine that people in power are always doing something malicious, and that whenever you can explain something based on incompetence, it's never really incompetence. The irony here is they're attributing a superhuman level of competence to people where there's, no, right. there's never any evidence of, of this kind of competence. I mean, we, Bill Clinton couldn't stop a semen-stained dress from appearing on the evening news, right? Yeah. Presidents can't do these sorts of things, and yet we're, we're asked to imagine that thousands upon thousands of psychopathic collaborators killed some of the most productive people in our society in downtown Manhattan just for the, what, for the, the pleasure of sending us to war in the Middle East, not to Saudi Arabia, where the hijackers came from, but to Iraq, when we could have easily found a pretext to go to war there anyway, and what a great war that was. And yet they did this without a single leak. There's not one person with a guilty conscience mm -hmm. who got on 60 Minutes and spilled the beans. And yet, generally speaking, you, you can't even keep the next iPhone from being left on the bar before it gets released. It's an amazing double standard of, of reasonableness there that gives us this kind of thinking. But what, So what, what's your feeling about 
the fake news phenomenon that we that we are now well, living through? Well, I think that the elevation of fake news uh, to the to the level of real news is is so pernicious and damaging. Uh, and it reminds me so much of my experience in the Arab world, where conspiracies and um, and you know, vie for you know any kind of uh, credibility with real news. And when journalism has been weakened, you know, I mean, for more than two decades now, you know, there's been a cutback of you know the resources of journalism. So that uh, the roots of the of our trade have been uh, partially pulled up, especially at the local level, mm. and it's very difficult, you know, to to measure how big a loss that has been. But you know, it used to be that there were you know news bureaus all over the world. You know, that we had you know different networks had you know the bureaus in all the world capitals and so on, and and we were much more plugged in uh, than we are now. And now um, the next step was the increasing partisanship that took over, the, especially the broadcast media, so that in addition to reporting what was the news, uh, there was a spin on it, an implicit comment on how the world is. And so you get your news uh, from one station or another, you have a different impression of, you know, what was actually going on, and so there's there's not a, a consensus uh, as there used to be about what was actually happening, and then finally the internet solidified this kind of echo chamber so that people could go on the internet and naturally what they do is they go find confirmatory mm -hmm. information that supports their prejudices. So these three trends have converged to the point that it's very difficult for some people to distinguish what is real and what is what is fake and that is a very dangerous situation and it allows conspiracies to prosper and go viral like crazy how do you think jihadists view the prospect of a trump presidency i think with some glee uh, you know the one of the goals of, of many jihadists is to create a, a polarization between the West and Islam. And certainly uh, Trump has not been loath to use language like that. Uh, so he, it may well be that he will press more strongly on the military accelerator and try to you know, do more damage. But our experience with that has been really mixed. Uh, and, you know, even uh, Rumsfeld, when he was the Secretary of Defense, worried that we were creating more jihadists than we were killing. Mm. And that's a continual problem. I'm not saying there's an easy solution or alternative, but the ways in which we have mixed into the Arab world and our Muslim, in the Muslim world, have, have not been so far very successful. What would you do if you were advising a president at this point? If you just think about the problem of ISIS and terrorist groups like ISIS, how would you, how would you fight this problem? Well, I, I think you have to be very cautious about how deeply you get into it militarily. I'm not saying we have to be absent, but uh, we should not be putting boots on the ground where we have no national interest. Uh, let's take the example of Syria. Syria is it's a strange country. I was there before um, before the Arab Spring, and it was total dictatorship. And the most secular Arab country I'd ever been in, I have to say that I was so surprised to see mm. this turn towards the Islamist revolution in a country where I had not really detected that at all. But what could we do or could we have done in Syria? It's not clear to me how we could have behaved in a way that would have prevented the catastrophe. You don't think taking out Assad's air force before the Russians got involved would might have been a, a good step? It might have, but then what would the consequences of that have been? You know, the choice that we were really facing, as it turns out, is between a regime that is really the progeny of Stalin or Hitler. I mean, it's the same mindset, and it's, it's appalling. Or al-Qaeda, mm. uh, the strongest force 
even today outside of the government forces, which are supported by Russia, is al-Nusra, the, the al-Qaeda affiliate. And that's a that's a, a terrible choice for any country to make. But the truth is that the Assad regime posed no threat to America. And given that reality, uh, I don't think that we had very much uh, to gain by overthrowing Assad. Mm. Uh, if and I don't, I don't endorse him staying in power, but uh, not. I don't think he should be removed until there's a clear consensus about how to support the Syrian government in a way that won't lead to uh, an ethnic cleansing of the Alawites and other mi- religious minorities including mm. moderate sunnis uh in that country and uh, so there you know there we have one outcome that we're living in that we know is terrible but the alternative outcomes may have been as bad and one lesson i've learned from living in the middle east for a lot of years is that things can always turn out worse i totally agree that this is a situation where it's it's not clear that success was on the menu in any discernible form and all options on their face appear to be bad. But even in that situation, we seem to have found a surprisingly bad option, which is, you know, we we have a president who drew a red line, which when crossed proved to be an empty bluff that damaged the prestige of our country significantly in the eyes of both our friends and our enemies. And then we just sat by and watched another I think you could call it a genocide. I mean, when when 500,000 mm-hmm. people die, it's pretty close to a genocide. So our, our claims of never doing that again after Rwanda are as hollow as we could have ever feared they would be. And now we, to everyone's astonishment, we may be witnessing the, the rise of fascist-style populism in Europe and the breakup of Europe in response to yeah. the migrant crisis, which, I mean, that was... If you told us that that was likely to happen if we didn't contain this problem, I, I feel like the civilized world, Europeans in particular, would have worked harder to contain it. Well, here is where I think America can do something. And I think the, the migrant crisis is, it, it, it offers the legacy of terrorism in the future uh, for decades to come. And if you think about, for instance, the Palestinian exodus, The entire Palestinian diaspora was 750,000 people. Mm. And think of all the misery that they've endured and have created for others in the form of terrorism. They're sort of the progenitors of modern terror. Five million, now close to six million Syrians outside of their country. And that's not counting close to 11 million people who are displaced internally. That is a a repository of, of despair. And according to uh, UNICEF, about uh, half of those uh, refugees are children, and only 20% of them are getting any kind of education. So if you were a six-year-old child in 2011, you've already lost your entire elementary school education. So what future do you have? And I, I understand the anxiety that Americans and frankly, people all over the world feel about bringing Syrian refugees or any Muslim refugees into their country is perfectly understandable. But the status quo is also very dangerous and left untended and uneducated, unemployed, uh, unhoused, unfed. You know, this population could become uh, a, a headache. Uh, in the future, that is the dimensions of which we'd be have a very hard time estimating. Suddenly, the whole world has the character of Israel a few decades ago. I mean, that, this is mm-hmm. something that I've always worried about. That it's very hard to put a boundary on this problem, and and I was by no means expecting to see this kind of knock on effects in Europe. But it it's amazing to see, and and it's amazing to see how ill-equipped we are to deal with it, because the moral imperative to help these terribly unlucky people is really compelling. You shine a spotlight on any individual family with kids about whom there is no reason to suspect a commitment to jihadism. 
of course you want to help these people. I mean, you're there, mm-hmm. but for the dint of just a roll of the dice, you know, that would be me and my family born in Syria. Right. Who am I to keep them out on some level? But when you, when you just look at the fact that some percentage of any population drawn at random from Muslim-majority countries will be committed to views that, that are deeply antithetical to the values of, of Western civil society, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom mm-hmm. to apostatize, it becomes a, it's very difficult to see what we should well, do about this. So far, I, in, at least in America, we've done a rather good job of incorporating asylum seekers. But there we're just lucky to have oceans, right? I mean, we just haven't had yes. to confront this problem geographically. What would we do if we were Germany or, or any of these neighboring countries where people were just showing up on the train tracks and we had to, had to decide what to do with them? Uh, I do fear that, uh, you know, that Europe as a political entity will fracture. And yet it, maybe the more immediate danger is in, the, in that region, in the, still in the Middle East, our nominal allies, uh, for instance, Jordan has a million uh, Syrian refugees in it. One out of four people in Lebanon is a Syrian refugee. Two million refugees in Turkey. You know, these are the people that we nominally call our allies. And, and those kind, that kind of demography can capsize those governments. And then you have, you know, the, inside those camps, the, the rise of alienation you know, it's, you know, I, th- I think that here is a place where America could lead uh, by trying to help those uh, really helpless people and demonstrate our goodwill. And that would create a repository of goodwill rather than just despair uh, for the future. But what are you picturing by way of help? I mean, even if we said we're going to put our best people on this, we're going to vet as many people as we can as fast as we can. And this year, we are going to take a whopping 400,000 refugees into our society. First of all, that seems impossible. But even if it were possible, it is just, what, a, a tenth of the problem? Yeah, I, I think we should take a share. And, uh, and, you know, the vetting and stuff like that that we have to do should be done. And it takes a long time. But I, I, in the larger sense, I don't think that politically, you know, we're in a place where we're going to see that happen. Mm. And I th- but that doesn't mean that doing nothing is a good alternative. I think we should be over there building schools and shelter. We should try to be carving out space inside Syria where they can return. Uh, there are places yeah. that are, are probably secure now. And the, the, as much as we can confine the uh, spillover of migrants to that region and try to return them to their own country. That's something that we should set as a goal. But doesn't that suggest some sort of military involvement to create those safe spaces and maintain their safety? I think you have to work, for instance, if you're working on the Turkish border, you work with the Turkish uh, security services. Mm. Uh, And the same with Jordan. And so, you know, these people are, I mean, these countries want the, the, the refugees out of their country more than we want them back in Syria. And uh, I think that, you know, the truth is, especially with Turkey, they've been so complicit in allowing this problem to get so far out of hand. Uh, And I think they're beginning to feel the consequences of it with these explosions that they've had recently uh, and the, and the mass murders. Uh, You know, this, this is a problem that in some respects that they have grown we can't assume responsibility for all the problems in the world, but I think the world does need our guidance. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Well, the marriage of, of the concept of guidance with the, the incoming occupant of the Oval Office, <laughs> yeah, I know. it's a little hard to square that, but I think we'll, we'll talk about him in a minute because the, the parallels between him and L. Ron Hubbard are difficult to overlook. But a final question in this area you actually have written a book about the the peace process with respect to the Palestinians and, and the Israelis, yeah. which I haven't read, 13 Days in September, about the, the Camp David Accords there with Carter and Sadat and Begin. How do you view the prospects of a democratic Israel at this point? 
Well, I, I think Israel has is, is made a, a, a terrible mistake in, in empowering the settlers. And uh, it, it, I, I think, honestly, that the two-state solution has been dead for some time, and it simply uh, hasn't been acknowledged. Uh, it's, and honestly, if the people in the region really wanted a two-state solution, there would be two states. There's in, inside Israel, there's there's very diminished peace movement. And uh, I think among those people who would like to see a two-state solution, uh, they're so demoralized and beaten by uh, the rise of the kind of right-wing politics inside that country that there's just not very much energy mm. uh, devoted to that. And, you know, the Palestinians are also led by, a, you know, kind of stagnant leadership, uh, aging, out of touch, uninterested in really pursuing uh, an, an alternative plan and and losing the patience of the rest of the world. And I, you know, I think honestly, you know, when John Kerry started uh, the, his efforts to bring about a two-state solution, he said quite openly, this will be the last time that America invests this kind of interest in creating two states. And I, I think that that was uh, an accurate statement. I doubt that we'll see any, you know, I know that Trump has said that he loved to make the deal. And if he's the great deal maker that he, he claims to be, then this is the deal of a lifetime. But, you know, what happened with Carter, Sadat and Begin, which was so interesting to me, these were three men of three different religions. They were all uh, very pious men. And um, actually, um, Carter and Sadat, probably more so than Begin, but Begin was the first Orthodox Jew to lead Israel. So they came together to solve a problem that religion itself had largely caused. And that interested me, how they were able to overcome their differences and their animosity. I mean, the, Sadat and Begin hated each other. Mm. And after the first couple of days, Carter had this notion that the Camp David would last three or four days. It was so clearly in the interest of each of these men to make peace that they would come to agreement. You know, they would, first of all, get to know each other and they would come to like each other. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, they would uh, trust each other. And the opposite happened. They just, you know, they just flared up after the second day. Carter couldn't let them be in the same room with each other. And the lesson of Camp David, I think, is that political courage is what really is the, is the missing ingredient in, in the peace process in the Middle East now. And I suppose to some extent in the U.S. But it was these men had terrible frailties. Uh, and, and Sadat and Begin were, you know, violent, violent men. Sadat had been a Nazi collaborator. Mm. Uh, he was an assassin. Begin was a terrorist leader. You know, they're scarcely the kind of people that you would think would come together and, and shake hands and make peace. But they had in common a tremendous amount of political courage. And so did Carter. And it really was courage because in the case of Sadat, he was killed over this. He was killed for it. And I think he must have had some sense of the price that he would pay. But, you know, Carter lost the next election, probably more because of the Iran uh, situation. But he was the first Democratic nominee not to carry a plurality of the Jewish vote. And then uh, Begin, uh, he, uh, after, shortly after Camp David, with no longer having to worry about the Egyptians, he invaded Lebanon, uh, an operation that was supposed to take 48 hours, and it, uh, Israel was in Lebanon for 18 years. And Begin was ostracized and went into seclusion for the last nine years of his life. So in a way, each of these men paid a terrible price for what they achieved. But they, what they achieved, the peace between Israel and Egypt, there hasn't been a single violation of that treaty since it was signed in 1979. Mm. And it's so remarkable to look at the Middle East, which is in such tumult, uh, worse today than it, it has ever been in my lifetime. But think how much worse it would be if Egypt and Israel were still at war. Yeah. I, I thought Majid 
who we mentioned before, made an interesting point in response to the recent UN resolution against Israel. And this idea, this opposition, which is always invoked, as you just did, between the settlers and the two-state solution, is something that Maja just called into question, and perhaps others have done this, but I actually hadn't heard this. He, he said, there's nothing in principle about Jews living in the settlements in what will ultimately be Palestinian territory, or the state of Palestine, that prevents the formation of such a state. The idea that anyone expects that Jews wouldn't be able to live among Muslims in Palestine is someone who expects the Palestinians to be absolute barbarians once they get a state, right? The mm -hmm. assumption is they're just going to kill all the Jews once they have right. their own autonomous state. Isn't that, I mean, that's a weird subtext to this negotiation, isn't it? It is. You know, the Jews lived in, you know, the Middle East forever. And uh, even in Saudi Arabia, you know, they were there when Prophet Muhammad or, you know, came into being, uh, you know, it, and, and un unfortunately, after 1967, uh, but even earlier after 48, you know, Jews were largely driven out of uh, the Arab world it, 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 with a great loss uh, to the Arab world because there's so many community leaders and so on that, that left that region. And uh, it became less diverse and far less interesting. And, but there is the precedent of, you know, Jews and, and Muslims living together and, and did so for centuries and centuries. But now we think that's impossible. Mm. Uh, it's, it's funny, when I was working on the siege, I was studying, I, I went to Brooklyn, where <laughs> Arabs and Jews live together quite happily because they have the same uh, grocery stores, you know, the same kind of foods, and, and they dress very similarly. You know, they, they naturally gravitate to each other uh, <laughs> living in the same boroughs. Yeah, well, phil uh, falafel is the, the underlying principle there. Yeah, halal food and so on. All of that, you know, causes them to feel a commonality that they actually have. And one of the things that I get really frustrated by is that the notion that, that, uh, that the Arabs and Jews are different peoples. You know, genetic testing shows that, the, that they are the same. This whole idea, you know, that the Palestinians, for instance, were a boat people that came in from somewhere far away, uh, is is absurd. The the idea that the you know that the Jews were in Egypt and were a chosen people and they you know spent forty years crossing the desert it is you know it, actually the promised land that was always a part of Egypt at that time is all part of the Egyptian Empire, so they were never out of Egypt uh, in a way. But this you know these kinds of ancient mythologies that drive so much of our current political predicaments. Even people who don't subscribe to their literal truth follow them as if they did. Let's move seemingly a great distance, but I think we'll find it's not very far at all to Scientology, because your book and Alex Gibney's documentary based on your book, both are fascinating there. You say at one point that your goal wasn't to write an expose of Scientology, rather you simply just wanted to understand the organization and, and the phenomenon, but it really couldn't help but be an expose given how goofy the belief system actually is and given how much is known and how much there was to know about L. Ron Hubbard. Mm -hmm. It seems to me the Mormons have a similar problem here, but to a lesser degree, because given how much there is to know about Joseph Smith and how less than divine many of the, the details of his life were, to shine any light at all on the man is to diminish the whole enterprise of Mormonism. I mean, there's just no way to overlook the fact that he was just a, a highly libidinous con man on some basic level. And one of the most amazing things about L. Ron Hubbard, and this comes through in your book, but it was especially vivid for me when just looking at, at footage of him in the documentaries, is just how unimpressive he seemed as a person. I can't see how people were taken in by him. And it's a similar problem I have with Donald Trump. I mean, both of these men, to my eye, are just so obviously making it up as they go along. They're, they're just bullshitting every minute of the day. I don't see how this isn't, in, in the case of Hubbard, wasn't more obvious to everyone. I mean, do you have 
were you flabbergasted to encounter L. Ron Hubbard and all his confabulatory glory? Oh, I totally understand what you're saying. Uh, he looks so goofy and, and it seems impossible that anyone would have taken him seriously. But then I've talked to a lot of people who knew him intimately and were maybe on one of his cruises where, you know, he went off on this little Scientology Navy uh, exploring the world. And they talk about how deeply impressed they were to be in his presence and this sense of charisma. And I thought that there must be something about that word charisma that is like a cloak that uh, somehow the audience puts on its leader. Uh, and and then they suddenly see something that we can't see, that he's charming and wise and glamorous. And uh, those things are invisible to me, but I accept the fact that through the eyes of the acolytes uh, that they must see it that way. Glamour is a funny word here because one of the other parallels between Trump and Hubbard, in my view, is their terrible style. The gilded stages of those Scientology events looked mm -hmm. like Trump's apartment to me. And there's some level of bad taste that I view as kind of morally disqualifying. I guess it is just a matter of taste for many people. And some people view that as glamour or, you know, exactly what you should be doing once, you, once you've made it. The thing for me is just both men in different contexts have such a patent history of lying about almost everything. I mean, just lying on a scale that you would just think would stop the rotation of the earth. Trump lies about how many floors his buildings have. He'll just add 10 extra floors to a building that don't exist, right? And Hubbard, I mean, the, the stories of Hubbard standing around with his devotees, pointing at various places in the night sky and saying, you know, that's where the fifth invader force lives and the leader has this name and we were driving cars, you know, 75 million years ago. There's a galactic overlord named Xenu. I mean, just saying all these things in a context where it's all perfectly unfalsifiable and just manifestly crazy, and yet it's being believed by seemingly very bright people. For instance, did, did you ever meet an ex-Scientologist who still believed some measure of the mythology, and they were, or were they all just amazed that they had ever believed any of it? Are they all like Paul Haggis? Or are some people still struggling with their lingering faith in Xenu and the hydrogen bombs and the volcanoes and all the rest. Oh, yeah. I've met a number of people that have struggled as they've come out of Scientology with shedding uh, the entire apparatus. Uh, they want to often, and, I, and in, in a way, I suppose they're not really ex-Scientologists until they do that, but uh, the, they may be outside of the grip of the organization. You know, there's this, I think, several things going on. And one is, you know, they were enchanted in, in a, almost a literal sense of the meaning of that word um, by the, the, the ideology, by the um, entranced by the, uh, the idea that, that you've had previous lives and that you will have more of them and uh, sort of caught up in, uh, in this scheme that, you know, I mean, what's fascinating about Hubbard is he just wrote endlessly elaborating this, uh, this fanciful uh, cosmology. And uh, if you accept the general principle of it, then you sometimes get caught up in the little nets of, uh, you know, uh, uh, different kinds of uh, elaborations of his scheme. And, uh, and you become an expert, you, almost like a, a mathematician studying formulas and how this would work and how that would work and this would equal that. Uh, if you're inside that world for a prolonged period of time, then it, is, it, it acquires a kind of reality for you. Although one of the, the strange things, and this is different between Scientology and, and really any other religion that I'm aware of, they hold back some of the crazier metaphysics and, and fake history, the cosmology, until you are deep into it. Paul Haggis describes this, this experience of reaching a, a certain level of his spiritual development and then being given the innermost documents of the organization right. where he is given a briefcase and have, has to go into a, like a bank vault to, to look at these handwritten pages that give you the, the answer at the back of the book of the cosmos. And 
this is where, and he describes it, his experience there, he was wondering whether it was some kind of insanity test. If you believe mm-hmm. this, they kick you out of the organization because it was all, this, this was the stuff about Xenu and that the, the souls of criminals were flown to our planet, which is called, uh, I think, Tegiak. Yeah. Or Tegiak, and then flown on something that curiously was the spitting image of a DC-9, I believe, or DC-8. And this, again, this is, what, billions of years ago, trillions of years ago? Yeah. And these souls are dropped into volcanoes and then plastered with hydrogen bombs. He had been in the organization for years and years before hearing this. Yes. And what's interesting about Haggis, and I think that um, it's probably true of the majority of Scientologists, he never really believed it, but he sort of assented to it in the sense that all this other stuff seems to be meaningful or helpful to me. And, uh, you know, there were all these uh, different, what Hubbard did mostly was create this elaborate scheme of human behavior mm. and, and how people react and what causes our, you know, what generates our behavior and, and, you know, what processes can change it. And uh, so for the most part, you know, Scientologists have their heads buried in that. And, uh, you know, I don't know a lot of, I don't think I know any Scientologists who uh, spend a whole lot of time thinking about uh, Xenu and TGAC and all of that, that, I mean, when we talk about belief, it's, it's always hard to know what people actually believe is true and what they just accept and and don't spend much time dwelling on. Yeah. I mean there are plenty of, you know, people who are, you know, filling Christian churches for instance who uh may not believe that you know Jesus rose from the dead or that he was born of a virgin mother but they 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 are in it for the community or you know there are just tons of reasons why people associate themselves with beliefs that they don't actually believe. Yeah. On that point, I I should say, I hear from pastors who are atheists, but can't figure out what else to do with their lives. So they're still ministering. uh, I've had mixed experiences with uh, when I I grew up in Dallas and uh, and we were very involved in our church and uh, Methodist church. And then years later, one of our pastor from a different church who'd been a close family friend his wife had died and he'd come to Austin where I live. And he said, you know, we had lunch and he said, you know, Larry, I never believed any of that crap. <laughs> and I, wow, that's, that was unsettling. And then uh, the pastor uh, and my, at the first Methodist church in Dallas where we attended uh, after I left a man named Walker Rayleigh who uh, uh, strangled his wife into a coma and uh, he was acquitted. I should acquit, uh, but he never contested the civil suit that her parents brought. And he was having an affair with um, the woman who was the daughter of our pastor when we were there. And she used to play the piano in my father's Sunday school class. So, you know, uh, all of these religious, you know, mentors have shown that, you know, they have, uh, not just feet of clay, but sometimes very dangerous impulses. Have you been threatened or, or harassed by Scientologists in the aftermath of, of your book and, and film? Well, Alex and I, well, first of all, going back, it started off as a New Yorker profile of Paul Haggis. Mm. And um, we were subject then and then the subsequent book and then the subsequent documentary, innumerable lawsuits threats. And, um, any actual suits? No, no, it was all noise and, you know, trying to, you know, Halloween scare you, you know, it, but we, you know, I was well defended by, uh, by our New Yorker uh, mm-hmm. attorney and by the Knopf attorney. And, you know, we had attorneys, uh, a, a number of them at HBO, which, uh, mm-hmm. was doing the documentary. So we, we always felt that we were on firm ground. And the other thing about the threat of a lawsuit against a journalist is that he who brings a suit opens himself up to discovery. And, uh, oh, I would love to get into the Scientology records. And I think they know that. So, uh, it, uh, you know, it never, none of these suits ever materialized. And I made clear, you know, I always gave the church its opportunity to respond 
to um, any charges that were being made against it. And, um, and there was a scene, a totally wild scene at, in New Yorker, um, the uh, Scientology spokesperson who originally would not talk to me came to uh, the New Yorker offices along with his assistant and four lawyers mm. uh, and a, a truckload of documents to respond to all these queries that I had seven linear feet of them. And uh, <laughs> I looked at that and I thought, you know, they're trying to drown me in information, but you don't drown a reporter in information. Right, right. You, know? <laughs> you just, it's like pouring water on a fish, you know, it just gives me more room to swim. And I thought, I've got a book uh, here. And uh, so it, it turned out to be very useful. But, you know, not just the church, but individual Scientologists such as, you know, Tom Cruise and John Travolta and others, uh, their lawyers threatened us. and. Uh, but after the article came out and after the book and after the documentary, what happened was not so much me and Alex Gibney, although we, you know, we had people following us at public events and so on. The people that talked to us were harassed in disgraceful ways. And, uh, I, 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 I get really angry when I think about it and I, I just appreciate the courage that it took for those people to step out mm. and they knew what risk they were taking. And it's not just the harassment that they were getting from the church, but, you know, the fact that families would disconnect with them, you know, their children or their mother or somebody wouldn't talk to them ever again. Mm. You know, that's a terrible price to pay. And, uh, and they, but they willingly did it in order to shed light on this organization. It's interesting to connect this back to jihadism for a moment and to, to see the parallel here, because there really is a, strikes me as a bit of a double standard here, because Scientology is, is mostly viewed as a cult, even though it has tax-exempt status as a religion. And the kind of harassment you speak about seems odious and no one would defend it, but it is, we are talking about people just, you know, standing outside your house with a video camera and being creepy, and maybe you can tell me exactly how they were harassed, but, you know, I'm pretty sure they weren't beheaded on television or burned alive. And if you imagine, just imagine if Scientology had a doctrine, not merely of disconnection, but the doctrine that apostates should be killed, right? And that this was a, this was carried out from time to time, and it was a, it was a credible threat globally for anyone who was a former Scientologist. How do you think we would treat the Church of Scientology? Would we do something differently? Uh, yeah, I think that you know, it, if if they're perpetrating criminal actions against non-Scientologists, the uh, you know, I I am sure that you know the the nation would be aroused, and you know, probably you mentioned the Mormons uh, at the beginning of this segment, and you know, they they most despised. Uh, group in American history, practically, and, um, you know, hounded from one state to another and, um, and their leader assassinated. And, um, you, you, I think that the, I think Scientology has taken a leaf from that book. Um, you do not want to, uh, provoke non-Scientologists. You save your wrath for the apostates of the religion, and it keeps it, it keeps it closer. You know this whole phenomenon of disconnection in is which are they, what they call breaking off family members and mm -hmm. people that are influential. It might open you up to other ideas other than Scientology. It, ironically, my very first book was about the Amish, who practiced something very similar. And, um, mm. and, you know, yet we think of the Amish as being, uh, totally harmless and, yeah. and they are harmless in, 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 in many respects, they're pacific, uh, they're sweet people. Uh, I've really enjoyed my time with them, but, uh, I've said before that when the Amish go berserk, the worst they do is they cut your beard off. <laughs> yeah, it was true. But they, they, uh, they are a fundamentalist, uh, you know, cult-like group. But, uh, but it shows you that you can uh, have these practices. They 
one of the differences with the Amish is that they they ask, ask their young people to leave the organiz, you know, their group, their community, uh, for a period of a year to go out in the world. Yeah, rumspringer. Yeah, see what it's like. See what you know, and then come back of your own free will. Well, of course, you know, you can't really go back if you don't go back, and um, and you can't marry outside of your, you know, the little clan, you know that. When we were, my wife and I were in central Pennsylvania studying this, is in the Kishikokwillis Valley uh, in the middle, just below uh, State College, uh, and it's famous among anthropologists for this schismatic nature of it. And, you know, there were the old order Amish with different color buggies. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you're a yellow buggy, you do not marry into the white buggies or the black buggies. And, and, and if you do, you know, even in this, tiny little community, you know, you're, you're cut off from your family. And it's a very cruel practice, I think, but, um, but it's enforced. And uh, the Scientologists are far more pernicious in the ways in which they punish their members, and uh, they extract money from them. Uh, they actually imprison them mm. uh, on occasion. You know, there, there's no comparison with uh, how the Amish uh, behave. But, it's, you know, it's, it's intriguing to me that practices among religious groups often parallel each other. This just speaks to the issue that specific ideas and specific doctrines actually matter. Mm -hmm. The Amish would be different if they had a doctrine that you know, if your daughter talks back to you before her wedding day, you should stone her to death. Right. If that were an active doctrine, if the difference between heaven and hell depended on your following that precept or not, it would matter. And I got to think it would matter if the Scientologists were living their, their lives the way the most doctrinaire Islamists and jihadists do. I'm perhaps being a little PC even framing it that way. I mean, just, just conservative Muslims the world over if they were forcing their women and, and girls to, to wear burqas, if they were performing clitorectomies on their daughters, if they were from time to time throwing homosexuals from you know, the rooftop of the celebrity center, there would be a SWAT team on, on the doorstep of every one of those centers mm -hmm. in the country tomorrow morning. And, yeah. and yet we, we, Scientology is, to compare Scientology and Islam would be viewed by certainly most progressive people and, and certainly all Muslims as a slur. But I think the balance of scary practices, I mean, the Scientologists can certainly be scary, but the balance really is, is on the side of conservative Wahhabi Salafi style Islam. Well, when I was investigating Scientology, I bumped into an FBI investigation. They were interviewing some of the same people I was interviewing. And so I began to get interested in what the FBI was learning. And uh, and then they dropped the investigation. And I wondered about that. And I, you know, I have not gotten a full explanation for this, but I, it's difficult given the First Amendment and the broad warrant of liberty that it awards not just to religions, but to reporters like me, First Amendment. It's difficult to f determine what is not a religious practice. Um, for instance, um, people are, you know, confined and beaten in, in, uh, in the clergy of Scientology. Well, you know, uh, and they're impoverished. Well, you know, Franciscan monks are impoverished. They get nothing. Mm. You know, they, uh, and they're, you know, penitents who uh, lacerate themselves. Once you start going down that road about what is what can be considered a religious practice, it's pretty amazing how broad, the, you know, and, and pernicious the behaviors are that can be permitted. And uh, I think can't imagine that you can sign away your liberty the way that uh, young people routinely do when they join the Sea Org and sign these contracts mm -hmm. for a billion years of right. service. Uh, but uh, the government is very uh, ill-prepared to determine what is exactly a religion. And, you know, the 
the powers are invested in the IRS, you know, which is probably, I mean, it's, it's a group of accountants and lawyers. You know, they're not really theologians. So, you know, they, they do not want uh, to be in the middle of it. All that said, you know, I think that a lot of the practices of Scientology financially very questionable. You know, that in the 70s, um, you know, 11 people were rounded up, went to prison for infiltrating and spying on government offices and stealing mm. files. And, and the IRS was one of those offices they penetrated. And yet when the IRS was trying to determine whether or not Scientology should have a religious exemption and was very not disposed toward doing that. They were the agency and individual agents were subject to more than 2,400 lawsuits by the church and individual members, and and it just caved in. That was a fascinating moment. They just terrified the IRS with the threat of, as you say, it was over 2,000 lawsuits, and that was sufficient. The IRS just went away, like, please stop suing us, and and we yeah. will we'll no longer look at your taxes. Yeah, it was. Uh, I haven't decided whether I can adopt that strategy next yeah, time right. I get audited. But <laughs> Maybe if you and I do it together, two lawsuits yeah, might be a class. Yeah. To this point about the, the Scientology jail, maybe I've forgotten, but I don't recall it being clear to me. Everything you said about this drawing a bright line between religious practice and anything else and what this means from a kind of a law enforcement point of view, it seems to me the golden principle here has got to be consent. Mm -hmm. Consenting adults should be able to do more or less whatever they want unless they're hurting some other non-consenting adults. So, you know, I, I practice Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I consent from time to time to let somebody who's better at it strangle me. You know, this would be an assault if I hadn't consented, but because I'm, you know, I want to learn jujitsu, and I've agreed to put myself in that position. It's fine, and it's actually incredibly fun to do. So the people who were in the jail in... It's called the Gold Base, and it's in Hemet, California, in Southern California. So now, could they have left if they wanted to? Were they, were they, were they just held there by the fear of disconnection from their family and friends, or, or were they actually imprisoned? Well, they were actually imprisoned, and some people escaped. And some people escaped and were dragged back. But there were, how has this not been prosecuted by the? But government? there were also people there, and maybe most of them, who it, you know, as I, I was asking that same question to some of the people who had been in the hole, and uh, in their discussions with the FBI, the FBI wanted to do a raid on the hole. With the hole, by the way, is two uh, double wide trailers that were married together, and uh, more than 100 uh, top-level uh, Scientology executives were confined there, some for a period of years, uh, with no, uh, you know, sleeping on the floor, no furniture, you know, it, uh, and doing these punishing exercises all day, but spiritual exercises and, and being routinely physically abused. Uh, and yet, what my sources were telling the FBI uh, well, if you do break in, everybody in there will just say it's it's all sunshine and seashells. That's what the the quote was, mm. that they were there uh, for their own volition, for their own spiritual advancement. Um, if you have, if you harbor thoughts about whether this is, you know, doing you any good, um, and you admit it to somebody, they would rat you out immediately. It'd be, you know, the punishment would be even greater. So people kept those thoughts to themselves if they had them. And uh, if, they, if they really felt um, that uh, they had to get out of there, then um, there were two options. One was to try to escape. And, you know, it, it was difficult. You know, this, they were locked into this hole uh, let out once a day for a shower. Um, and, uh, they, uh, they, you know, this, the compound has got barbed wire fence, uh, with, you know, coils of razor wire around it. And, uh, it's not easy to get out of there. And even if you do, uh, the, you know, the, they were, it was called, what was called a blow drill. Uh, this team of Scientologists would, they, they, you know, there are only a few bus stations in the, it's very, very remote. Mm. 
one highway going through there. It's not easy. They're, you know, they're in a valley of these, these hills, you know, amply supplied with rattlesnakes and thorns and cactus. And so it's not uh, an easy place to escape. But even if you do escape, you know, they'll follow you. And one guy was picked up. Um, they knew he was a baseball fan and they found him in the parking lot of San Francisco Giant Stadium. Uh, you know, these stories are legend among Scientologists, and it's a real caution for those who would like to escape. The other, the other way they can go in and say, "I'm, I want to get out. You know, I'm, I'm done here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm no longer a Scientologist." Okay, very well. Uh, you know, suppose you join this organization, you know, as a Sea Org member, which is what they call their clergy. Say you joined it when you were 12 years old or 15, and you're now 34 years old. And uh, so for your entire adult life, you have been you have not been educated. Uh, you have no job. You have no uh, marketable skills on the outside of the world. You know, the, you're, certainly your employer is not going to give you a recommendation. you everybody, you know, will no longer talk to you, your your family, your friends, your children, you know, your parents. Mm -hmm. Then no one will ever talk to you again. And then you'll be given a bill for services rendered. Uh, I mean, you've only been paid $50 a week, so you got no money. Uh, but then you'll be given a bill for fifty, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars uh, for all this, you know, the lessons that you've taken and so on that uh, uh, were Scientology lessons. And meanwhile, they have a record of every dark thought you've ever confessed That's in your right. auditing sessions. So, you know, the the levers that the church can bring to bear are pretty powerful. And uh, so that's one reason why people stay in the hole, even if the doors were unlocked. Do you think a similar principle explains Tom Cruise and John Travolta? These are obviously the two most prominent celebrities. Yeah. Their continued tenure there, or do you have a sense of their level of actual commitment to the the beliefs and, and the practices? What explains what seems to be a kind of really a, a shocking level of, of moral culpability on their parts for propping up this organization? Because it's, yeah. it's pretty clear they must know about the whole and the fact that people are paid, you know, 40 cents a day or whatever it is and not educated and the whole phenomenon of disconnection and all of the attendant suffering. How do you explain their role here? Well, I've been very hard on Cruz, especially because I, I, I've thought about how could Scientology change? You know, it, Mormonism uh, survived and it's actually seen in a lot of places around the world as being this kind of super American religion, which is ironic given it was so anti-American and that's what got it in trouble in the first place. But it's totally uh, different. Uh, religion in in many respects, uh, and such that you know you have Mitt Romney uh, running for president, and his religion is not even uh, much of an issue. So you know that could happen to Scientology, hmm. but uh, it's unlikely to change at all as long as David Miscavige is in total control of the organization. So how could Scientology? Uh, reform at least is human rights abuses. And, you know, one route was, well, the IRS could reconsider its tax exemption. But, you know, given how cowed they were by the church and how they utterly collapsed uh, in the face of all those lawsuits, I don't think they've got the stomach to go back to that. And the other only other route I could see to any enforcing any kind of change would be for some of those celebrities, and especially Tom Cruise, the most notable Scientologist ever, to say it's time for us to make a change. And we need to look at some of the actions that we've taken as an organization and, and, and make amends. He has he's done very much the opposite. So and why? I mean, in a way, what got me interested in Scientology in the first place is that, you know, these are very notable people. They lend their prestige and their names to uh, probably the most stigmatized religion in America today. 
And I don't think it advances their careers by hardly at all. I mean, very much the opposite. It's uh, people sneer at Scientology. So why, why do they commit themselves? And I think in the case of celebrities, there are a couple of things going on. One, like many Scientologists, they feel like they've gotten something out of it. And um, John Travolta, for instance, um, you know, almost his very first experience as a young actor on a, a movie set in Mexico, uh, an actress on the set gave him some Scientology treatment and and he went exterior, which is uh, the sense that he had a, uh, an out-of-body experience. Hmm. And then um, when he got back to L.A. and went to the Celebrity Center for classes, you know, he said he was up for this role in Welcome Back, Cotter. And so the teacher had all the students turn in the direction of the studio and telepathically send this message that John Travolta is right for the role. And he got the role. And uh, so he always attributed that to Scientology. And, you know, I don't know exactly what secrets he may have told in, you know, in these therapy sessions that are recorded. But I did speak to a Scientologist who said that he had been assigned to assemble all the dark secrets on Travolta just in case he ever tried to break out. And uh, so it could be that, the, you know, that he hasn't left just because uh, what the church might hold on him. On the other hand, he said that when his son died, you know, there's a source of a lot of consolation. So there's, a, you know, there are a number of considerations with him. With Cruz, you know, he was um, already a movie star when uh, he was exposed to Scientology. And um, he claims it helped him with his dyslexia. The way I look at Cruz and some of these other celebrities, People who go into Hollywood, like Tom Cruise, typically do so when they're very young. Uh, you know, they drop out of high school or they, you know, they just barely graduate and then they go directly to Hollywood. They're, they have, you know, very limited educational achievement. And, uh, and sometimes they become movie stars right away. Sometimes they eat cat food for seven years and never go anywhere. Uh, and so it's an amazingly big risk that they take. Mm. And there's always, I think, among a number of, of people in in Hollywood, uh, a sense of inadequacy of, of not being uh, of not knowing very much about the world. And uh, but except for their own world and Scientology compensates in an amazing way, which is that you don't need to know all that stuff. Mm. You know, we will teach you not just how the world works, but how to control other human beings. And we will teach you that, you know, we will demonstrate to you scientifically that you've had past lives. And moreover, we'll give you a mission in life, which is to save the universe. Well, I think those things really reach Tom Cruise. And, and he, there's an additional factor that is especially difficult for celebrities which is the degree of public humiliation they might subject themselves to if they walk away from the church. They walk away realizing, you know, to their shame that they have given, in many cases, millions of dollars. They've added their name to an organization that has oppressed many parishioners and exploited them. Uh, and and they they like Tom Cruise may be responsible for the, the you know many people joining the church, and then they are opening themselves to the liability of having all their darkest secrets poured out into the National Enquirer or People magazine or any any such source. It's a, a huge risk. So has anything like this happened to Paul Haggis? I mean, it seems to me he would be the perfect example of someone who is reasonably prominent and left in a spectacularly adversarial way. He really uncorked this thing. And now he's out there functioning in Hollywood. What's happened to him? Well, they've attacked him. They, you know, they, they've done what they could. They, you know, he says they went through their, his trash and then, you know, uh, yet, you know, in order to be intimidated uh, by the church, in some ways you have to consent to that. 
And he simply hasn't consented. He refuses to be intimidated. You can read scurrilous things about him uh, on the Internet that the church has put out there. Mm -hmm. And that's true, you know, of me and everybody else has come close to the church. But if, you know, with with Paul, he's not a he's not a movie star. He's a kind of behind the scenes guy. You know, I, I think that in terms of, you know, he's got a little less to lose. I think, you know, you can look at Leah Remini, for instance, who is a, you know, a television star. And she's doing this show now uh, in which she's vociferously attacking the church and its practice of disconnection. And, you know, they're certainly after her, but I, it's apparent she doesn't care. And if you don't care, then the church is really powerless. In in the old days, uh, you know, the church would frame people. And, uh, you know, the, that was, I haven't seen that happen in more recent times. But, you know, when they when their critics would go after them, like Paulette Cooper, who wrote uh, one of the very first exposés of the church uh, called The Scandal of Scientology. I think this was in the 70s. Uh, they tried to uh, uh, frame her for uh, attack, you know, threatening attacks on President Ford and on the church itself. And they actually got a grand jury. They were going to mm. get an indictment. They were trying to get her sent to a mental institution. Mm. And it wasn't until the FBI broke into Scientology headquarters to round up all the material that had been stolen from the government by Scientologists that they found the uh, actual plans to attack Paulette Cooper. Otherwise, she might have been prisoned. Fascinating. This is the point where I become excruciatingly aware of how generous you've been with your time. <laughs> yeah. But I, I want to, if you can manage it, I want to touch maybe just for a few minutes on your book, Remembering Satan, because mm -hmm. I, I found that story. I remember reading it as a, a New Yorker article first, and it's like a, a twilight zone that you just can't believe has happened. Can you tell that story in, in broad strokes? Yeah. I Back in the 80s, there was a what we now understand was a mass hysteria uh, based on what we call recovered memories. And these were memories that um, oftentimes uh, in therapy, especially uh, young women with eating disorders, would uh, be coaxed into remembering things that they had repressed, uh, according to the therapist. And they would explain why they're dysfunctional now. And the answer for so many of them was that their father had abused them sexually. And in the course of this, some of these memories became, because they weren't accurate, quite extraordinary. And, and there was a sense that, you know, uh, they had been satanically abused by cults. And um, I got interested in this when my own therapist said that they were seeing a lot of patients, uh, young women mainly, who were suffering from multiple personality disorder, which was a really rare uh, diagnosis. And um, that in therapy, they were recovering these memories of these satanic abuses. And my therapist told me that there were, that Satanists were responsible for 50 murders a year in Austin. Well, we've never had that. We, one, one year we had 52 murders. That was in 1962 or something like that. But it, you know, it's never approached that level. And I did, but you know, what I have to stress to you, these are really smart, cogent, reliable people. Uh, but they, they were deeply sympathetic to, uh, to their patients. And uh, they invited me to a workshop uh, for multiple personality. And it was led by these women who said that they had multiple personalities. One of them said she had 300 personalities. Mm. What a management problem that posed. But, and it was bizarre to me because these women were talking about murders that they had witnessed, babies being cut up on them in, you know, neighbors being slain. And I thought, well, if people really believe this, why isn't anyone calling the police? And then I went to a workshop for uh, cops 
that was led by a cop who was a, you know, a national authority on satanic abuse. And uh, he said that uh, Satanists were responsible for 50,000 murders in the U.S. every year. <laughs> well, we've never had that many murders, at, you know, in, in the U.S. And, and these were cops. And I thought, what is going on? So I went to um, my editor at the time, uh, Tina Brown. And I said, I was interested in writing about multiple personality. And she, oh, I'm, you know, and I said, well, uh, you know, when they explore these, uh, these in therapy with these young women, they often have these memories of satanic abuse. And, oh, that's hot, hot, hot. You know, <laughs> she loved that. So my, I was, I was, uh, I went into this, I always try to go into it with a kind of studied neutrality. Mm. Um, to see, you know, do not form your opinion until you have uh, encountered, you know, the evidence. And there were already hundreds of cases uh, around the country in courts and uh, in charges in police stations about uh, satanic abuse. And it was all over the daytime talk shows and you know, it was, it was a nationwide phenomenon. Also, the, there had been the, the McMartin preschool trial. Yeah, then, the right? daycare cases. There were a number of them. There was a corollary action going on. Uh, and so I, I started researching, uh, and I found this one case in Olympia, Washington, where a, a man confessed. Uh, and he was a deputy sheriff. Uh, Paul Ingram, he confessed to abusing his daughters and they had accused him of these sexual uh, satanic crimes. And I thought, well, if there's any truth to it, then then this would be the case that proves that satanic ritual abuse really exists. So that was the case that I uh, I decided to, to profile. And what I found uh, is that you know, Ingram was a Pentecostal churchgoer. Uh, his pastor came into the jail, his own jail, where he was in, being incarcerated, um, and told him that God would not permit any false memories to come into his mind. And then a psychologist came in and hypnotized him. And he began having these uh, vivid, uh, extraordinary visions of satanic ritual parties where they abused his daughters and, and his wife and so on. And, uh, and the girls began having more and more uh, elaborate thoughts, but they ne their memories and their father's memories never coincided. So there was, it was very frustrating to the investigators. And the girls talked about having been nailed to the floor and you know, raped and, you know, they had gave birth to these babies that were sacrificed. And, uh, you know, it was, it was an unbelievable story. And then Paul, you know, because he confessed, he went to prison for it. And then implicating others. Didn't he have like a poker game or something where the other, yeah. the other men were implicated? Yes. And that was a, <laughs> there's a, in, in the craft of writing, uh, there's a one little trick that I love I, that a friend of mine taught me called the rubber band theory, which is that when you plant an idea uh, you know, a question in the reader's mind, you don't answer it right away. You, you know, you tease it out and the more tension that builds up, the more pleasure the reader gets when the question is answered. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Jim Raby was uh, the name of one of Paul Ingram's uh, colleagues in the sheriff's department in Thurston County. And uh, he had, the girls and Paul implicated him as one of the Satanists who had been doing the abusing. And he, he was, you know, upset and, uh, and jailed and he demanded a polygraph and, and he failed the test. <laughs> mm. And this was a two part New Yorker story. And I left the New Yorker readers hanging for a week, uh, wondering, you know, if this was really true, right, right. but I, I had another polygraph, uh, administered to him in which he passed, uh, with flying colors. But it turned out later that the girls had they were still virgins. There were no scars on their bodies. You know, there was no evidence to back up any of these fabulous uh, visions. And yet uh, Paul Ingram served 18 years uh, and uh, for a crime that he never committed, only one that he remembered. 
wasn't there a moment, forgive me, it's been a long time since I read this, but wasn't there a moment once he was imprisoned where it actually became like a, a proper Twilight Zone because either you or the investigators, someone went to Ingram with facts that they just, they knew were false because they had made them up yeah. and pinged him about these memories. Like, you know, your son said there was another thing that happened with a horse or whatever it was, which they just made up. And Ingram said, oh yeah, 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 that did happen. Yeah. Like he just, he just proved to be the most suggestible person on earth. It, uh, there was, you know, the, the, how suggestible people are is very interesting to me. I used to be very interested in hypnotism. and. Um, the uh, I I was probably a dangerous eighth grader. I went through the abnormal psychology shelf of our public library and learned how to hypnotize my sisters. And but it, you know the fact that you can actually plant ideas in people's minds. There was a case that I read about when I was doing research for that book. Um, a, a and I you know this is totally unethical uh, on the part of the therapist and it wouldn't I think be allowed to be done now, but uh, he um, hypnotized one of his patients and he told her uh, under hypnosis that um, she was she came late which wasn't true, and he wanted to know why she was running late and so she said well I was driving along the highway. And I saw a cow and uh, it was trying to give birth. And so I crossed the fence and I was trying to help the cow. Uh, and then suddenly the therapist said, and a light appeared above. And those are the only two things he said. You were mm -hmm. late and a light appeared above. And suddenly it was a UFO that was descending and took her up. And, you know, so she had this extremely vivid uh, UFO delusion. Mm. And uh, when she, when the therapist awakened her, he told her what she had said. And he said, now this was not, this did not happen. You know, this was not true, but it was weeks before she could shake off the sense of reality that it actually had happened. And so I think there's a commonality between all these UFO things and the hysteria about Satanism and the daycare things that all of something was cooking in our culture. You know, the, it made a deep impression on me on how susceptible all of us are to uh, the, you know, the suggestions that other people put into our minds. Yeah, well, this obviously ties back nicely to the, the fake news phenomenon we were talking about earlier in the conspiracy yeah. theories. Are you familiar with the book, the 19th century book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles yeah. McKay? Yeah. Yeah, because there's, there's a section there on the, on the witch mania in Europe, which I just recorded a, an audio book edition of just that chapter, but it's exactly the same phenomenon that you describe in the Ingram household. I mean, you have these, these hysterical young women just kind of broadcasting whatever psychopathology is going on in the family into this confabulatory act of imagination. And it's happening in the context of a religious world where more or less everyone in sight shares a religious worldview that mm -hmm. the devil's real and walks the earth, right? So of course he's going he's gonna to come and tempt somebody sometime. If I recall, not only did the family share this worldview, but some number of the cops who were investigating oh, the crime. Absolutely. Yeah. It, and that, you know, the thing that's surprising, but I think, you know, a lesson you have to learn from this, you know, the, the demand that the, the people who claim to be victims their great demand was believe us. Uh, you know, if you don't mm -hmm. believe us, you are re-abusing us. Right. And of course, the therapist and the cops are helpers. Their goal is to protect the victims and, you know, take care of them. And so they're naturally drawn to try to help anybody that's in such distress. And, the, you know, the distress appeared real. I mean, the, I think the distress was real. It's just that the cause of the distress wasn't real. And uh, it caused them to suspend their uh, rational judgment of what was actually going on. Because if you thought about it critically, then in some ways you were betraying the trust that this victim has demanded. And also, I think just to spare ourselves a lot of pain on Twitter, we should make it clear that we are not disputing the fact that somebody somewhere gets raped by her father. And absolutely. And in fact, even in this case, if I recall, 
th- there was some real dysfunction in the house. I think the brothers were having sex with the sisters or something, right? It may have been true. That was the first allegation by the, the and there was no, his, you know, there was no satanic coloration to it. Right. But, you know, one of the, one of the consequences of this is that young women who may not have been abused, but had these extravagant visions were in some ways deprecating people who had real experiences mm. that weren't nearly as elaborate or, you know, uh, fanciful, you know, they, and colorful. And so uh, I talked to women who had been in therapy groups with people who said that they'd been satanically abused and they felt totally cut out of the conversation and overwhelmed. And so in a way, they were, the, they were really victimized by this. Mm. Okay, Lawrence, a final, very brief question, but I have to ask it because I, I've been thinking about broadening my, the range of my podcast guests. And just out of nowhere, I had the idea that I could, I could go to the, the Supermax prison in Florence, Colorado and interview the Unabomber about his <laughs> anti-technology manifesto. And I was wondering just, you know, how one did that and if that was possible, if he had done any interviews in the past. And then I saw that he reached out to you, the one journalist on earth he would want to talk to, and that you showed no interest at all in, in talking to him. So tell, tell me why, given the, the breadth of your interests and the kinds of people you engage, why you would have no interest in interviewing Ted Kaczynski? Well, it's not true that I would have no interest in it. Um, the, um, and, you know, I, I, if it's, it, it looked like a real letter to me, I, I have no idea why anybody would fake it, but, you know, so I, I'm, and I did respond to him, uh, and never got a reply, but, uh, there was a time when I was interested in, in, in writing about, you know, really heinous criminals to try to get a sense of, you know, what's going on in their mind that causes them to do the things they do. And I don't think I, I don't think I had written to Kaczynski, but I, you know, Hinckley and others that, you know, assassins and so on. I had, and, and all that stuff comes up in freedom of information stuff. So I got, uh, sort of jeered at by the Washington post media guy when he found all these letters that I'd written. But, uh, you know, the truth is you, you really can't get into supermax. Uh, I I wanted to talk to Ramsey Youssef and and mm-hmm. and Omar Sh- R- Abdul Rahman who are both in Florence and um, I just couldn't get any traction. You might have more luck than I, but uh, you know they for the most part I you know they you have to be a family member or you have to have some kind of sanction. Normally, when you want to talk to a prisoner. Um, you know, you get their lawyer to help you out. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's, but as far as you actually getting into Supermax in order to talk to them, that's a challenge. Well, listen, Lawrence, it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you. And I am incredibly grateful you took the time. Next time, I hope it's in person. I look forward to it, Sam. Thanks for your interview. Best of luck with everything. Okay, take care. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes.